Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool. And it hasn't been uh, that often recently that <laughs> we've been bringing you the latest in everything cool. I've been on a bit of a vacation, so thank you very much for uh, bearing with our little break. Uh, very necessary break. I uh, uh, went out to uh, see my niece, Erin, and uh, her husband, Chris, her now husband, Chris, get married. And uh, I was in um, Scotland in an, a place called Apple Cross Scotland, way on the west coast of Scotland. And then I went through the Isle of Skye and we went all through the Highlands, brought our daughter, my wife and I brought our daughter and we had an incredible adventure, it was awesome. And it was a much needed uh, break and uh, lots of fun, but I still was playing games and following all of the crazy things that were going on. And we're gonna get into some of that today. We're gonna have an amazing show for you. Uh, but let's get started with our rundown today. It is dedicated to uh, Ramrod. Uh, Victor Lucas still at it. Love your game reviews. Wish EP was still on television. T a lot of people say that TV is very different. TV has changed. It's very different these days. I also want to give out a shout out to uh, Mike Rod. And I don't know if Ramrod and Mike Rod are the same person. Could be. Uh, but Mike Rod sent me a, a tweet with a picture of us. We met at E3 and it was a very sweet tweet. So uh, Mike Rod, Ramrod, if you're, if you're related, uh, <laughs> this rundown is all yours. Okay, uh, watch out because Nintendo just made some smashing announcements in their latest Nintendo Direct presentation. The biggest news is that Overwatch is coming to the Switch. Similar to the Switch port of Diablo 3, Blizzard promises that all the content, characters, and weapons from the existing versions will be available in the Switch version, although the graphics will obviously take a bit of a hit. That lands October 15th. In the meantime, Banjo-Kazooie are making a surprise debut in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate today. On top of that, a new character, Terry Bogard, from the SNK fighting series, Fatal Fury, is joining the game this November. This makes him the fourth of five planned DLC characters for the game, but looking ahead, Nintendo says even more new characters are on the way, although they haven't given us any hints about who those might be. The Nintendo Switch Online service is getting something it frankly should have had all along, Super Nintendo games. Like the existing NES games, you'll be able to play a library of classic SNES games when you're online, including the usual suspects like Super Mario World, F-Zero, and A Link to the Past. They begin rolling out tomorrow, and Nintendo is also releasing a classic SNES USB controller very soon. If you need more classic games, the 2002 Star Wars game Jedi Knight complete with all of its original content. It's offline only, though, single player only. No word about other the other games in the series yet. Now, here's a surprise that's a little chilling. Nintendo announced the all-new game Deadly Premonition 2, a sequel to the 2010 cult classic that arrives next year. And in the meantime, the first game is available to, uh, available to play on the Switch right now. Finally, a new definitive edition of, 20, of the 2010 Wii game, Xenoblade Chronicles, is coming to the Switch next year. It was a very strong Nintendo Direct and lots of great little uh, teases and tastes of games that are coming up. Um, I think the most exciting thing for me, for sure, is the Super Nintendo library. I'm a massive Super Nintendo fan, and frankly... As it stands right now, because you get the NES library and the SNES library, and they're going to keep doling stuff out, and yes, you got to pay for Nintendo Online, this kind of tips the Switch into the favorite console of all time category for me. There's been incredible games that Nintendo has been publishing. Yes, we need more third-party support, and yes, the horsepower could be beefed up, but this library on this machine has been blowing my mind, and the fact that they are um, allowing you to dip into the past for, you know, a reasonable price. Um, you know, I'd still like to be able to re-download all the games that I purchased on the eShop over the years. It's still phenomenal, though, the fact that you can port around all of these classic games. Super excited to buy another uh, SNES controller. This will be about my millionth con SNES controller, but I'm, I'm happy to buy another one. Uh, and I'm super happy to uh, play these games again and share them with my family I think it's absolutely the right move uh, but you know classic games that are that are uh, uh, gonna be an interesting fit on this machine like the Witcher 3 um, Divinity Original Sin 2 very much looking forward to those I know they're gonna kind of challenge the horsepower of the console uh, but it's just amazing that you can carry these massive titles around with you and then uh, plug them into a television set and enjoy them with your family 
Very, very good moves, Nintendo. Keep it up. Very, very exciting. All right, the biggest news that happened while we were away is the uh, Spider-Man divorce between Sony and Disney. After cooperating to share Spider-Man for the last few years, Sony and Marvel's parent company, Disney, uh, have had a very public falling out. Both sides have offered their own version of the story, but it seems that after the success of Spider-Man Far From Home, Marvel and Disney wanted a bigger slice of the profits from future Spider-Man movies, which Sony refused, deciding that they no longer need their help on the franchise. Whoever you decide to blame, this is obviously a huge blow for fans. It means we won't be seeing Spider-Man in future Marvel movies, and it also uh, we also won't be seeing Marvel characters like Nick Fury in future Spider-Man movies. Now, how the hell is this supposed to work? This Spider-Man exists in the MCU. He was introduced this way. He was introduced with all of these supporting characters. Ta uh, Iron Man was, uh, like the co-star of uh, the, the Spider-Man Homecoming film, and Nick Fury's all over uh, Far From Home. Uh, and, the, you, you know, the end reveal at, at the end of Spider-Man Far From Home, from Far from Home uh, which I won't spoil because I know a few of you haven't seen it yet, but it really suggests that the MCU needs to be involved in this big calamity that's kind of teased at the end of the thing. It doesn't make any sense. And... Um, I suspect that this is, uh, you know, it's an ongoing game of chicken, and I think that the uh, the parties are going to figure it out. I also think that this is kind of a way to drum up publicity and to get people excited and to create fervor so that when they do finally announce Spider-Man 3 in this universe, um, they can say, we've got it all back together again, or they can do something stealthy and sneaky and kind of suggest that it's going to be a non-MCU Spider-Man movie, and then, oh, oh, we slipped some MCU characters in there, which would be kind of rad, or maybe they'll have some uh, Fantastic Four tees or something like that, which is now owned by uh, Marvel and Disney. Um, so we, uh, I think we might be getting played here a little bit, which is fine. Um, th th these are obviously massive studios with a massive property. The truth is, is that Sony doesn't need the MCU to make Spider-Man movies successful. We saw that with the Into the Spider-Verse. We saw that with the, uh, the previous runs with the Spider-Man movies. Even if you didn't like them, they made a lot of money. And Sony has made tons and tons of dough off of Spider-Man. That's why they're not going to relinquish it. I did hear that they were willing to sell Spider-Man back to Marvel for $10 billion, and I, that's just a rumor that I heard. Um, I think he's worth it, quite frankly. I think that uh, with Iron Man kind of off the table, Marvel needs one of the, they need their Batman. They need their, it's so nuts, isn't it? It's just so crazy. It's like if DC was uh, making DC movies with all the superheroes except for Batman, because Batman was sold to uh, Universal. You know, it just is so bizarre that this all happened. And uh, I think it's inevitable that Spider-Man is gonna go back to Disney and Marvel. We may even see Disney and Marvel assume all of Columbia Pictures and Sony Pictures library and buy that whole thing outright in order to get this. Um, but uh, yeah, right now it's it's uh, it, it's an interesting game of Monopoly that we are watching. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I fully suspect that we're going to see Spider-Man back in the MCU. I just don't see how they could have Tom Holland out there without that. You know, it'll be cool to see Tom Holland with Tom Hardy uh, in some Venom Spider-Man kind of thing. Um, I just want great movies, first and foremost. And I do think that Spider-Man movies can exist, you know, outside of the realm of the MCU. But everything that they've done with Tom Holland and set up with this Spider-Man incorporates all of that. So it's just utter nonsense that they can't make this thing work. I suspect that they will. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it all gets resolved. Now, uh, last week at, the, uh, at their D23 Expo, Disney also announced loads of new shows for their upcoming streaming service, Disney+. Plus. The biggest has to be the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, which will take place between the events of the prequels and the original trilogy, and see Ewan McGregor return to the iconic role for the first time in, uh, in more than 15 years. There has been rumors that Obi-Wan uh, was going to be getting a movie series, but a Apparently, Disney and Lucasfilm feel that the story will work better as a TV series. We can expect to see Obi-Wan on new adventures while in exile on Tatooine, all while watching over the young Luke Skywalker. And it begins shooting next year. Very excited about this. I think that even if um, you're not a fan of the, uh, the prequel trilogy, which 
I'm not. Um, there are elements that are cool, but I think the coolest thing in that prequel trilogy, and I think this is kind of a universally accepted deal, is that uh, I, Ewan McGregor made an excellent Obi-Wan Kenobi. He, he uh, transformed into this character. You fully believed that he was a young Alec Guinness, and uh, he was just cool. He just, you know, he fit the role really well. He went from, uh, you know, the younger apprentice in the first uh, in Phantom Menace to being that sort of cautious, careful, and you can understand why he's got that sort of cautious, careful kind of attitude with uh, Anakin, right? Because he'd already seen some of the horrors of this war that was going on in the stars. And uh, so he, he was uh, a fascinating, it was a fascinating, accomplished portrayal, and he's been wanting to do it. We've all been wanting to watch him uh, revisit this role, and I think that... Uh, uh, they're making the right choice to bring him back. And it's going to be cool to see what other kinds of cameos Disney can kind of sprinkle into here because now, uh, you know, th this time frame, I think it's kind of in that solo time frame. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Lando Calrissian or, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's been interjected. In, it, it's, it, it's becoming a, a populated, expanded Disney universe again. The real trick here is the Mandalorian has to be awesome, and Episode Nine uh, has to really hit in a in a powerful way. We need to all care about Star Wars again. Blake is shaking his head. He does not believe that that's going to be true uh, or possible. Um, but I have I have faith. I have I have hope. I have a new hope for Star Wars, and I think uh, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, but these are good moves. I'm very much looking to Mandal looking forward to Mandalorian, and I'm very much looking forward to this Obi-Wan show. Uh, and I am looking forward to Episode Nine. Let's keep our fingers crossed that it is awesome. Now, we're getting a better idea of what to expect from the next James Bond movie, and yep, it's sounding like a James Bond movie. Eon Productions and MGM have revealed that the uh, next film shall henceforth be known as No Time to Die making it the sixth Bond movie to have the word kill or die in the title. They've also confirmed that the movie will begin with Daniel Craig's version of the character retired in Jamaica, only to be pulled back into service to aid his friend, CIA agent Felix Leiter. Daniel Craig was reluctant to return, to return, so this may be his final turn as Bond, but we'll have to wait and see. No Time to Die infiltrates theaters in April of next year. Uh, very much looking forward to this. What I wasn't looking forward to were all of these cheesy websites um, that would put uh, Twitter, Twitter links out there saying, the new James Bond title has been revealed, and then you had to click on the link to go to some page for them to p type in No Time to Die. You know, it was just so cheeseball. Well, just put it in the tweet, man. Everybody's looking for clicks and links and stuff. It was like, it's four words. Just put it out there. Um, I like the title. I think it's okay. I think it's a little... Um, uh, it's in keeping with some of the Ian Fleming titles of the past. It is a little, you, you know, like it, it's a bit weird to think that somebody's so busy that they don't have time to die. Uh, but clearly James Bond's got to save the world in this one. Uh, Rami Malek is the bad guy, and uh, they're going to have a female 007 to kind of kick things off in this. These are the, the plot details that, that have been leaked out and uh, teased so far. Um, I, I don't like that I know this stuff, and I'm sorry for sharing this and spoiling it for anybody out there that didn't want to know any of this stuff. Uh, but I am hopeful that this movie turns out to be great. And it's also being directed by one of the uh, filmmakers that worked on True Detective. So it's going to have a different kind of vibe and a different feel to it. Um, hopefully it coalesces. And uh, if it's awesome and it makes hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, if not a billion dollars, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Daniel Craig back for another one. I know that they tried to get him back for two. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Very much looking forward to this one. Uh, the other thing that's been happening, of course, is that Daniel Craig's been consistently getting hurt while making this movie. So that might be it for him. He was like, no, I'm done. Uh, now over to another globe-trotting adventurer. Lara Croft is making a return to theaters. I'm excited about this. Last year's Tomb Raider movie is getting a sequel. Deadline reports that MGM has given the film a green light and even set a release date of March 19th, 2021, with shooting slated to begin next year. Alicia Vikander will be back as the iconic video game treasure hunter. With uh, While behind the camera, the film will have a new director, indie filmmaker Ben Wheatley. The last film 
failed at the box office domestically, so it was doubtful that a sequel would happen. But thankfully, it was a huge hit overseas, especially in China, which is why the studio wants more. I think Alicia Vikander was a terrific choice as Lara Croft. I think she's fantastic. And there were some pretty cool sequences in the movie, but the games are so M-rated and, um, you know, frankly, kind of frightening and and uh, legitimately filled with high stakes, you know, and you see Lara Croft go through some just br- brutal deaths in the game. And then when you see the movie, it's almost like they made a theme park version of that. You know, it's it's kind of family friendly and safe. And I don't know if the answer is to go to, uh, uh, you know, an R rating for the sequel, but something has to be done to kind of up the stakes and up the ante a little bit. Um, I saw Free Fire, which is Ben Wheatley's, uh, one of Ben Wheatley's game uh, movies, and it was interesting. It was, uh, it was like a shootout. It was like a two hour long shootout. And um, it was, it was competently made. Interesting choice here. Um, but the guy's got a resume. He's got a bunch of different uh, flicks out there and, and uh, clearly isn't afraid of uh, shooting movies with a little bit of action. Hopefully this has a ton of action and uh, Alicia Vikander can, uh, can kick some serious ass as, uh, as Lara Croft. I think she's, I think she's wonderful. So let, let's hope that this is going to be a great movie. Now, it's official. You'll be able to play with your friends in Cyberpunk 2077 eventually. After years of playing coy, Cyberpunk 2077 developer CD Projekt Red has confirmed rumors that the game will have an online multiplayer component. The plan is to launch the single player in April as planned, uh, with the multiplayer following at a later date. Although they haven't produced, uh, provided a firm release window, so there's no telling how long we'll have to wait. This makes Cyberpunk 2077 the first big game from the studio with multiplayer. And I think when you introduce a, a world like the one that we're going to venture into in Cyberpunk, it really makes you feel like you'd like to jump in there with some friends and explore it together. Um, and I, I'm excited like crazy for this game. I suspect that maybe the multiplayer will be something that we only see on the next-gen consoles. Uh, I. I, I feel like it's going to take them some time if this is their first multiplayer experience. I don't think they can just tack it on. Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't feel like this is uh, a, a huge action role-playing experience like this. I don't feel like the, the best, you know, use case for multiplayer here is get into uh, a deathmatch. You know, like I feel like they need to come up with some really interesting ways for people to explore cooperatively and uh, do some missions and stuff together. Um, maybe in the vein of some of the stuff that we've seen in Grand Theft Auto V, you know, some of those heists or something like that. Uh, Very, very excited about this, though. This game, I think, is going to blow us all away when it comes out next year. Um, All right, my friends, that's going to do it for our very lengthy rundown. There was some catching up to do. Uh, Right now, we are going to turn things over to our cub reporter, Johnny Millennium, who is live on the scene at, uh, well, he's not live. Live to tape on the scene at the Coalition. I'm Johnny Millennium. I'm here for EP. I'm here with Rod Ferguson, the head of Coalition Studio. And Rod, I can tell in the studio Everybody is excited. There's a little bit of excitement in the air that finally Gears of War 5 has gone gold. How does everybody feel about this? Uh, It feels amazing. You know, we started over two and a half years ago and to work so hard to create a game that's so big. I mean, we have five different ways to play and, you know, with Horde and Escape and the campaign and Map Builder and Versus, like there's just so much to do in the game. I just came back from playing it, yes. and I was really, really impressed. How many people overall have made this game? Because it's there's a lot of people behind the scenes. Even right now, you know, I know they're working downstairs even more. It definitely takes the village. It's not any one person. You know, we yeah. have went from the dev studio to marketing and PR and the regions and Salesforce and everything and community. There's a lot. It, a lot goes into it, and that's what's really different. I mean, if you look at what we did back in the original, Gears 1 was probably a team of 80. If you look yeah. at the dev team, and now we're like, you know, multiples of that, just because with the technology now, you have to be so, like, we used to have people would be their level designer and they also do the environment art, they also do the lighting, they also do the texturing, and now every one of those is, is an individual person, you know, because it's so complex. Our campaign runs at 4K60, and to do that, you just require specialists in all those disciplines. 
how long is the campaign mode if you collect everything and do every single thing? We found it was really interesting is we, like normally when you do a play test for a campaign, a user research test, we could kind of bring in people over a weekend and we'd say, okay, play all day Saturday, play all day Sunday. Try to get through the campaign. Yeah, try to get through the campaign and so we can get like where our difficulty spikes and what's the feedback from players. That was one of the things that was like, we ran into is where we like booked them in for the first weekend and they played and we're like, oh crap, they're not even wow. close to finishing the game. And so that we had to book them in for a second weekend to come back to so they could actually get even closer to finishing. And so that was our first eye opener of like, wow, we've got a really big campaign here. Let's get inside. So Gears 5 is all about um, basically picking up where Gears 4 left off in terms of war. War is here. Right. So at the end of Gears 4, we had a brand new enemy called the Swarm. Gears 5, the Swarm are attacking. The world is at war. Cities are crumbling, world is going up. <laughs> Mass hysteria. Mass hysteria. So we're telling this grand story. Then we have a very personal story about Kate Diaz, who is our hero. She breaks off from our main group to try to understand what is her connection to the swarm. Right. And in doing so, she realizes that maybe she is actually the true threat to the planet. Now, what is the difference when we look at a game like Gears of War 1, where the storyline was very simplistic, going forward and moving it into Gears of War 5? As you see, you've expanded it. We have some different storylines with Kate, uh, some more emotion going on there. It's it's all about the characters and the core of the story that we're trying to tell. Gears of War 5, we still have at its core, it's about found family. It's about our characters and their connection to each other and those ties that bind that ground the story. So even though we have a giant scale war on our hands for Gears 4, at its core is a story and these relationships between our heroes. I'm not going. New players, I think it's a great story, but for people who've been with the franchise for a while, you finally get to learn like the origins of the Locust. You get to understand Kate's relationship with the Locust. Finally get to learn where yeah. they come from. I've been, I've been waiting <laughs> the whole time. And where are they from? Exactly. We get to find out where they're from this totally. time. Yeah. That's great. And so I think that's going to be part of it. People have that idea of, like, I just want to go and discover like what this, what's been driving this franchise for the last 13, 15 years. One of the things, like I've been personally with the franchise since 2005. Wow. So to me, to, to realize that this is kind of like the culmination of what we've done so far, like I just think people are going to get a kick out of it. Play it to with that thing! You know, when we looked at Gears 4, people said, great game, but maybe you didn't push the envelope hard enough. And that was because we were a new studio and a new team trying to prove ourselves. And now that we've done that, Gears 5 is really about trying to push even further and challenge expectations. That was surprisingly easy. You know, we've definitely carved a little bit of a niche uh, uh, for Gears 5. It still, of course, relates to the Gears universe, but uh, we've had the ability to do that because of sort of the setting and, and how much diversity we're able to put into the box. Pretty early on, we sort of gravitated towards the ice glacier environment as the signature look for Gears 5. It's unique in the Gears world. We haven't seen it before. It's really kind of visually striking. So the desert area is kind of the counter to the snow. One of the things we pushed was the sort of really red, blood red sand color. Kind of pushed it as far as we could before people's eyes started hurting and then just dialed it back another 5%. So that really gives it a really distinct sort of look and feel that I think people will remember after exploring that environment. The place looked huge from the outside. These are the largest levels we've ever built. You know, some mm -hmm. of the levels are like 50 times bigger than any Gears level we've ever built before. So there's a lot of new things with exploration where we have the skiff now so you can go from mission a mission and you can do side missions and discover collectibles and discover relic weapons and so there's a lot more player choice in this game than we've ever had before and that's on top of Jack so Jack is a new addition which is sort of our way to bring RPG elements to the game Jack do the honors now you have abilities and you can go invisible and you can lay down proximity mines and you can do an overhealth shield to protect yourself so Jack is part of our original trilogy Jack was a support bot that was with Marcus right. and the others in Gears 1, 2, and 3. In Gears 5, we now have an all-new Jack, but he's still very true to that spirit, right. that helper bot. And he's a brand new way of playing for the player to have abilities that help attack and support, but he's also a key part of a fabric of our story universe. I was playing him just now, and I thought he was such a really cool character, absolutely. Okay, Jack, let's pull some records. His crazy assault ability is hijack, where he can flip guys to your team, and if the playable Jack is playing them, he gets to be the enemy. We have a limit to what you can hijack. The bosses have a very short hijack time on them. In the case of the warden, you actually have to knock his helmet off before Jack's allowed to hijack him. Jack is super fun to play, easily approachable. You can, from you know any skill level, from the newest newbie to like really hardcore veteran horde fans. Jack actually plays differently. He can sort of fly over cover, he can get over obstacles that maybe some players cannot, and he has different functionality for his abilities. What about those players that are completion 
receptionists that want even more, what can you offer them in the future? We're going to be doing something. We're doing operations. We call them operations, which are basically every three months, we're going to be putting in new content, new hives to escape, new maps to play, new characters with new abilities. So we're just going to be keeping that going all the way through. I mean, it's one of those things now, like you don't just ship a game anymore. No. You ship a service, whether it's through esports, new maps and characters for multiplayer. It's the edge of the multiplayer alone yeah. is its own game. Cliff used to say, like, you come for the campaign, you stay for the multiplayer. Yeah, it's, that's just absolutely <laughs> true, especially for me playing Gears of War 1. I started playing this the campaign and I was like hooked. Me and my friends every night were on that game. And now with what we have with Horde and I think Escape people are going to really love. You know, having a new PvE mode that's three players so it's a lot easier to find a group to go in and play and it's aggressive and so you're playing mm. instead of being a three hour survival it's like now you've got 20 minutes how fast can you get through this? It's really the largest change in the multiplayer from Gears 4 to Gears 5. We have also brought some big changes to Horde mode this time around. Characters are now heroes and they have their own own ultimate abilities, their own passive, their own progression and skills that players can customize for their own experience. The progression in Horde is specific to those hero characters that you play there. In Gears 5, there's no for purchase loot boxes. We really heard from fans, you know, looked at where the industry was going. We looked at how the European Union is looking at regulations for loot boxes, and we just decided that it really wasn't a great fit for our game. We have direct for purchase exclusive customizations in the store, but we also have the Tour of Duty, which is a new progression system where you can unlock exclusive customization by achieving particular challenges. And then we have Supply, which is really like free content for just for playing. All three of them have have exclusive content. They don't overlap. What is purchasable isn't earnable. What is, you know, earnable isn't purchasable. The ones that we were talking about is exclusives. They are cosmetic only. The only exception is that hero characters will be both earnable and purchasable. So they're really, if you don't have the time to go through and do the challenges, you can purchase them. If you'd rather go the challenge route, that's available. And we aren't going to make them so outrageously difficult to get that, you know, people will be forced to buy. We really see it as trying to find a sweet spot where people feel like it's a significant achievement to go do it, as well as priced in such a way that people feel that they can really get value out of that money. What is the one thing mm -hmm. that you look at the entire game and you're like, I like this the most. I'm making you choose, <laughs> and I know that's difficult to do, right. and we can't choose, you know, right. which is our favorite kid, but what is the <laughs> one thing that you look at and you're like, this is the thing I'm most proud of with Gears of War 5? Uh, you know, I think it comes down to just the for me, I, I'm all about the shared experience. And mm -hmm. we always talk about co-op is really core to Gears. Like we used to say that like, co-op is cake, not the icing, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so for, to have like three player co-op on local split screen, to be able to sit on a couch and play three people in through the campaign. The fact that, you know, we have Escape this three player co-op, to have Horde this five player co-op. That ability to bring people together, because when I'm talking with fans and I'm doing poster signings or I go to a convention or mm -hmm. a conference, what really touches me and when they tell me about how it connects them as a family, yeah. you know, I play with my brother long distance, or this is how my family gets together on the weekends or what have you and that connection to the fans and to each other is what's really important to me and so the fact that we not only brought co-op but we brought you know local split screen co-op and the fact that so much co-op is in the game itself is what I'm really proud of. <laughs>
Uh, but for the most part, the multiplayer is, is going to light up this weekend. So I can't really, you know, dive too deep into this. And I'm going to have some further thoughts on the game. It's a massive game. So I, I can't give you a definitive here is how I feel about the totality of this experience today. But I can tell you that I have been blown away by uh, the fidelity of the experience, not just the visuals, which are beautiful in 4K at 60 frames per second on the Xbox One X. I played it on the S here in the studio, and it is not the same. It is not as good. You take a massive knock when you're not playing it on a 4K capable system. It's hard to go from that. It's hard to go from the video that we just showed you guys to playing it on the on the S. And it's uh, it just makes it feel like we're back in kind of last gen, you know, uh, because we're getting so much information about what's coming with the future of video games. And N NVIDIA's got videos coming up all the time about ray tracing and stuff. And there's ray tracing on the PC version of uh, the game. I've heard it's incredible. I have not checked it out on a super sweet PC. I've just checked it out on the X and the S, and it's gorgeous on the X. It's been blowing my mind. It could be the best looking game that I've played on that platform. It could be the best looking game I've played. It's so beautiful. The lighting, uh, you know how you go into dark areas in video games and the little sort of flickers of light and stuff like that are, are meant to kind of evoke um, mood and uh, create ambience? Well, that's definitely the case here, but there's also a uh, practicality with the way that the lighting is kind of uh, etched into the scenes. And you can see little bits of uh, interactive, interactive uh, elements and stuff that you can walk up to based on these little light uh, sources that are scattered. It's so effective and it's so beautiful and there's gorgeous lighting and gorgeous uh, um, you know, colored lighting all the way through this. Uh, and you know, a, lot, a, a lot of emphasis on uh, um, the damage that war creates. Uh, clearly on the main characters that we get to know a little bit more about um, and the emphasis in this game as we all know is is a lot on Kate and her backstory and, and her sort of uh, familial connections and, and the psychological sort of damage that uh, um, some of the stuff that has un unfolded in previous Gears games has uh, done to her. But we also uh, spend time playing as JD and there's lots of interactions with Marcus Phoenix. And that's one of the things that I... Uh, I really admire uh, about Gears uh, sort of in this new era because the, the original Gears games were amazing, but there was a, um, uh, there was kind of a, you know, a sameness to the experience. Like we were going back into the, into the fray with, with these big burly, no neck muscular dudes and we we're going to just kill lots of stuff. And that was fun. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but the, the new games kind of take all of that into account and they build on top of it and they have this kind of lineage they have this uh uh you know through the era kind of connection so you, you you see these developers these game makers really try to stretch out the mythology of gears and give it some permanence and give it some ways different ways to kind of explore the material and so when you jump into the gameplay it, it adheres to a lot of principles and a lot of things that we're familiar with a lot of uh, uh, you know fil familiar mechanics and systems that uh, play great in, in uh, you know with modern uh, f resolution and, and uh, all the bells and whistles that this hardware can provide uh, but there's also a lot of emphasis on on uh, filling in the gaps and, and um, using the echoes of moments and memories to kind of make you feel like wow there's a real weight and resonance here the flip of that though is that as you're playing through the game, you're also thinking how many other ways they could have gone and how many other ways they could have challenged the way that we envisage uh, a Gears experience. And so they have to adhere to some uh, parameters that, that make us familiar, that are familiar to us, uh, but they also have to interject and throw in some new things. And they also have to deliver multiplayer that kind of is this core central tenant that everybody is expecting out of this experience. And so I, I'm sitting playing the game super entertained and super impressed with all of these different layers that the, that the developers have put in, all of these different modes. But I'm also thinking, uh, you know, there's still invisible walls. I can't climb where I want to climb. And there's a little bit of, um, a little lack of clarity of exactly where I'm supposed to go until you press a, uh, uh, y you know, the, the, the right bump or the left bumper and it kind of guides you with the little icon and stuff. And I, that has, I think, a lot to do with the constraints of, of um, this kind of dated design with gears. 
um, which is all rooted with, uh, you know, the cover system and, and uh, sneaking into different things. It just felt like I was hemmed in a little bit more than I wanted to, even in the face of this really exciting new um, elements that they've put in there that are kind of uh, a throwback to uh, uh, Uncharted 4 and the Lost Legacy game, a little bit of God of War, where they have these open areas where you can uh, zip around on um, your skiff. This um, It's kind of like a... It, it, it's like a snowmobile a little bit, and it ha it's like a snowmobile with a sail on it, and you're able to cruise around on the ice and on the sand in these big open spaces and kind of explore, and I thought that was really nice, and I thought it was really cool as well that um, there was a lot more to explore, and it wasn't just corridor, uh, arena battle, corridor, arena battle, jump scare. There's elements of that for sure, but this... Um, freedom to kind of examine and explore all of this rich detail in the environments I, was a welcome piece for me. I just, you know me, I've been playing games for so damn long that I see something like this and I, I can't help but think, oh man, wouldn't it be great if you could climb those rocks and, and jump over there? Or wouldn't it be great to kind of approach this from a, a slightly different dynamic and a perspective? It's hard for me not to do that because I, I play everything, you know, and I think about... Uh, the Breath of the Wild experience, or I think of uh, an, an Arkham game or something like that, that gives me a lot more freedom and, and uh, different ways to kind of traverse the, the, the environments. And I know that that hasn't been the Gears experience, uh, and I know that a lot of Gears fans would go crazy if they just threw that in there. That's stuff that pops into my head as I'm playing through the campaign. Now, that's just a chunk. Uh, it's like one of five fingers in this game. You've got the arcade mode, you've got the versus mode, you've got the horde mode, you've got the escape mode, which is new, uh, which I had a chance to play at E3. And I've enjoyed all, all of those, all of those different flavors, but I haven't played enough of them that I can say, um, you know, this is all a robust buffet of enjoyable elements and I love every element of it and here's my final score. Uh, what I can tell you about the, the campaign is that I have been super impressed with the storytelling and the new mechanics, particularly the, uh, the new abilities that you get with the Jack robot and uh, the you know, opportunity to freeze characters and to uh, you know, scan the environment and, and um, give yourself extra shields and stuff. Some really, really fun stuff in there. But I clearly have a lot more game to play, um, and I've got some more thoughts to kind of put together around this. But uh, congrats to the coalition. You guys have clearly crafted something massive, and it's going to make Gears fans very, very happy. All right, we uh, are going to be getting a little uh, let's uh, play in chat. But first, it's time for this day and everything cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for September 4th. On this day in 1998, the tech industry and the entire world began to change forever. Stanford University students Larry Page and Sergey Brin incorporated a new company called Google with the aim of securing investment in order to launch their own search engine. Up until that point, search engines ranked their results based on how many times a search word appeared within a website, but Google did it differently. Larry Page and Sergey Brin came up with a new idea called PageRank, where the top search results were determined by how many pages existed within a website and how many other websites link back to it. This meant that more important and relevant sites would appear first and be easier to find. Google launched to the public shortly after the company was incorporated and it quickly grew in popularity, making other search engines obsolete and the word Google itself eventually evolved into a verb meaning to search something. As Google grew, the company raked in revenue from advertisers and they expanded into more than just a search engine, buying up other companies like YouTube in 2006. Today, Google is one of the biggest and most powerful companies in the world with the ability to influence billions of people across the globe. Okay. All right, we've got Let's Play in chat, and today we are going to be playing uh, with Dartaz. Uh, Alex, yes? Yep. Alex is going to be playing a little Astral Chain, and uh, don't know if you've checked out this game on the Nintendo Switch yet, but it is freaking incredible. Uh, this is the opening sequence here, and... Uh, we are starting with the credits, and you're on the back of this, like, cyber bike, and you are racing to headquarters. You're a cop, and um, you've got all the, t the uh, developer names and stuff like that scaling down as you are racing through this tunnel. And this is the only time that I think you're... That I, well, so far, I've, been, I've played a big chunk of this game, and it's the only time that I 
was on the bike, was at the very opening sequence. And that's that's Platinum Games for you, man. It's so cool. HQ, do you read me? Have, have any of you guys been playing this? No, that's such a rad game. All right, okay, so it's Let's Play and Chat. If you've got any questions or comments, any thoughts, uh, a, uh, yeah, D Dr. Game Love is saying uh, next-gen consoles will, are built for ray tracing, right? Yes, absolutely. Cody J says, hello, Vic, good to see you, big fan. Thank you, Cody J, thanks for being here. Um, uh, gotta run, uh, later I'll also just realized my subscription didn't renew for some reason. I'll start, I'll start up again soon, Blake uh, and Vic. That's very cool, Donnie. Uh, that's Swangor. See you later, buddy. Uh, Fat Chimp, I don't think I'll, I'll use ray tracing until like 10 years from now. That's okay. There's lots of games to enjoy that don't use all the modern technology. And we're looking at one right here. This is, you know, a, a Switch title, which you can see some of the alias on. Like that. It's not the most high-def, high-res thing that you can play today, but it's still freaking beautiful, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I, and I... Honestly, most of my game experience on this on this title has been on the road and playing it in handheld mode. It's such a treat to be able to see it all scaled up on the big screen like this. Um, I set my graphics to the lowest settings just to just to hope uh, for 120 frames per second. That's a fat chimp. Uh, and for shooters, I need to squeeze out every single frame I can. That sounds great. Uh, comment from Blade Blur. Gonna uh, head out soon, but wanted to say hope you had an awesome vacation, and I hope to celebrate. A somewhat decent uh, birthday tomorrow. It's your birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Blade Burr. That's awesome. Uh, Sam I am 111. How surreal is it for that uh, Toby Fox is doing music for two separate Nintendo published titles, Little Town Hero and Smash Ultimate? Uh, this is the Undertale guy, right? This is fantastic. It, it, Nintendo had a really good showing today. You know, lots of diverse concepts and really small ones like the Obra Dinn game and, and uh, Lots of big, massive reveals. Um, you know, the fact that Overwatch is finally coming to the Switch, very cool. Uh, Faramir, question. Have you had much time to check everything uh, that came out of PAX? No, I have not. I didn't, uh, I imagine that there's tons of indie game news. No, I have not checked out all of that stuff. I have checked out, uh, and I did read about uh, a lot of the dark, heavy stuff that's been going on in the indie world, which I didn't really want to get into because there's a lot of depressing stuff in there. Um, but uh, uh, I was more focused on on this show, a uh, return to all of the everything cool stuff that's happening right now. Uh, Vic, excited uh, for the Turbo Graphics Mini? You know I am. I've been uh, loving this trend of uh, of these different minis out there. And we did uh, uh, we did a um, uh, we re we revealed some of our Sega Genesis Mini um, game reviews a little earlier than Sega liked, and they reached out and said, can you hold off on some of that stuff? So I'm going back and forth with them on when we can post all this stuff. But I reviewed all 42 um, games on the Sega Genesis Mini. They're like capsule reviews, but I reviewed them all in one, one uh, nice video, and Blake did an awesome job cutting that. I also did a video where we, uh, actually I'm gonna hold, I'm not gonna tell you guys, but there's a lot of stuff coming up with the, uh, 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 with the Sega Genesis Mini, and now that the Nintendo um, Super NES stuff is announced, I think we should start digging into some of that stuff. A lot of 16-bit things are in the works right now, uh, as well as covering all the new stuff. Um, Vic, do you think Robert Pattinson will do a good job of playing Batman in the new Batman movie from Jeff Meacham? I was not uh, overjoyed to see that he was attached, mostly because of all of the, uh, uh, the Twilight... Um, gossip kind of baggage that, that had come with him as an actor. I think he's a very good actor, though, and he's done some really cool uh, work. I want to see this new Lighthouse film that he's out there. I've seen Good Time. I love that movie. Um, I think he's, he's a good choice, but he's so high profile that I just kind of wish that the actor would benefit from this platform, you know, like Christopher Reeve did and uh, like Chris Hemsworth did. Um, just kind of like we chose him because he is the Batman, you know, as opposed to we think Robert Pattinson will sell tickets, so we hired him to be the Batman. And But I think he's going to do a great job. And, and more than anything, I'm super excited for Matt Reeves, uh, who, who did a wonderful job with the Apes movies, to um, take, the rel take the reins and, and create something fresh with Batman. I think that'd be awesome. I'm very excited about that. 
now you're getting into the fun combat. What do you think of this so far? I'm loving it. Actually, yeah. detouring from Final Fantasy VIII. Yeah, it's a nice detour. Yeah, right. And it's, uh, at first you think it's going one way with the the platinum. Do you know anything about this game? Okay, well, you get these, um, these extra beasts or these little extra kind of robotic, um, uh, enhancements that are connected to you by this astral chain and you're jumping back and forth into a, uh, a different plane of existence and, uh, and that stuff comes in a little bit later but you basically get augmented with these uh, this ability to have this uh, character that exists in a different dimension um, that allows you to uh, wrap around bad guys and do all kinds of cool things with uh, with this actual chain attachment which is very very Surreal, and only a company like Platinum could think of something like this. Um, uh, Robert Pattinson is an incredible actor. We got from uh, Z Shrugs one two three. I'm so excited about the SNES games coming to Switch from Abby Jameson. Me too. I uh, I think I, I I yelled out loud, which is not always cool for me to do in a uh, cafe space, but uh, I'm super excited. Um, Steve Buscemi should be Batman. There we go with a very interesting casting choice from Edwin J. Uh, a fat chimp after Michael Keaton, Christian Bale, and Ben Affleck. I have faith that they cast the right guy for the role. Uh, those are big shoes to fill, so they sure some saw something incredible uh, from a fat chimp. I think they saw a big mountain of money. And I think that they saw, uh, you know, I think the press around him being cast is good for Warner Brothers and good for the... Cur it's the same thing with Heath Ledger, you know? When he was cast as the Joker, it was like, what? What are they thinking? Um, and then he blew us all away. So I, I suspect something similar will happen. Um, I, I guess the... the be, because I was there when Christopher Reeve was revealed to the world as Superman, you know? And I just believed that that guy was Superman. And uh, you know you're only 25. Yeah, and I'm only 25. I don't. It's weird, sort of uh, space-time disparity there. Uh, but uh, I kind of want something similar with with Batman, you know. Hey, and I was also there when okay? Michael Keaton was cast as Stay Batman, and and uh, I was like, what the hell, Mr. Mom is Batman? This is like wrong. I don't believe in the. And then I loved the movies. I thought they were great. Um, I thought Clooney was a good choice to play Batman, and then they made him bat nipples and and. Uh, Mr. Freeze uh, ice capades. It was oh my god! What the hell were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it was so so bad. Um, all Marvel ever looks at is money. Tyler Fisher with a very cynical interjection right there. Question from Famous Seamus. Uh, question: uh, With the end of the year coming up soon, are there any games out now or coming soon that you think will be game of the year material? Uh, yeah, I can give you some of my Game of the Year contenders so far. Uh, Yoshi's Crafted World is one of them. I know you're all, you just did a spit take right there. All your coffee or your juice is spitting out of your nose, but I love that freaking game. Uh, I thought um, uh, The Division 2 was pretty damn exciting. Um, I thought um, uh, Days Gone was incredible. Uh, and I know that's uh, contentious. Not everybody believes that or, or shares that. Um, uh, I think this run this past week has been pretty phenomenal with Gears 5, uh, with Astral Chain, and with um, Borderlands. Uh, and Borderlands is next week, but with, and with Control, I thought Control was sensational as well. Uh, I loved the new Fire Emblem. We've had a good year. We've had a good year. We haven't had a overloaded year with lots and lots and lots of things, but we've had some really, really good games. And now the game avalanche is starting. I've got, I got two codes in my inbox as we started the show on new games that I've been looking forward to. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting Rocket and Ray Gun Award conversation this year for for best game of the year. Could be the new Zelda, even though it's a remake of a classic Zelda. That might en actually end up being one of the most enjoyable games of uh, of 2019. This game is dope as hell, though. I don't know if it's getting the love that it deserves. This Astral Chain, it is so much fun. Um, I would actually love to see two actors portray Batman, one handling Bruce Wayne from a fat chimp. Interesting comment there. Rick Savage, Christian Bale is the best Batman. Steve Buscemi is a talented actor, but not for Batman. We're not seriously thinking about Steve Buscemi for Batman, are we? <laughs> Come on. That is, that is the weirdest chat on the internet right now. 
<laughs> Steve Buscemi is Batman. Um, are you going to play uh, Monster Hunter Iceborne? I did get the code for that. I have to play that. I'm getting inundated with stuff. Um, but I do want to jump back into that. Um, I, I've heard it's fantastic. Will Scott C. Jones be around for Rocket and Raygun Awards? I don't think so. I've talked to Scott a couple times about doing... Uh, I talked to him for last year, but he, he because he's not a uh, he's not a critic right now. He's not he's not reviewing games. He's not playing as much stuff as he was when he was working with us. Um, so he feels a little like he's out of his field there. You know, he's not really doing a full analysis of all of the different titles out there. I'm definitely going to ask friends from um, the, the game reviewing community, some of the people that you've seen on uh, EP Live over the at uh, this last year. And I thought it went great with um, with viewer submissions last year. I love that so much. Those were some of my favorites, so I definitely want to do that again. Um, but we have a long way to go before we're talking about rocket and ray guns. We still have a full season uh, in yeah, between. We, we have the season of games, right? Like, yes, the game avalanche, I call it. Um, uh, Kingdom Hearts 3 was incredible, yeah, Dr. Game Love. Yes, that was an awesome game. Yes, and also Resident Evil 2 and Ace Combat 7. Uh, we've had that some great, thing. great titles this year. Uh, 2019 Game of the Year, Half-Life 2 from Blake Siefkin. That's why he, <laughs> that's why you never see him in the Rocket and Reagan Award. He only has best sports game, Half-Life 2. Yeah, he just never has the the the, uh, the response or comment. Uh, I, I get fantasy game. <laughs> best, yeah, I got the chance to listen to Scott C. Jones talk at Fan Expo and was intrigued to check out his channel afterwards. Farmer, uh, I didn't get to Fan Expo because I was traveling. Not I didn't go to PAX. I didn't go to Fan Expo. Uh, I didn't hear how his panel went, but he did a live uh, version of Heavily Pixelated, his podcast. And he had an audience there. So I, I don't know. I haven't caught up with him. I've just been back for two days. So... Uh, but I hope it went great, and I hope you had a good time if you were there. I know he gets into some heavy stuff with that podcast, uh, but I hope it was great. Uh, Geek Hero of Comics and Consoles, Vic, are you concerned with the lack of hype for Star Wars Episode Nine? Uh, I, I am a little concerned. I think everybody's a little bit reserved right now. I feel like J.J. Um, Abrams is our only hope, you know? Help us, J.J. Abrams. You're our only hope. like he—he he has got to—he's got to stoke the fire again. You know, I think the the lack of like <laughs> yeah, Solo could have been great if they had just let Phil Lord and Chris Miller kind of finish their vision. And I'm not taking anything away from Ron Howard. I think he he finished the movie uh, under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, and he did a fine job. But it shouldn't have been fine. It shouldn't have been a seven and a half or a seven out of ten. It should have been a nine out of ten at least. That movie, for it to justify itself, and the, the budget was, uh, and the box office wasn't there. And I, I, I've said this many times about the Last Jedi, but Ryan Johnson, I think, did some great things with that movie, but it didn't feel like it was really honoring the work that had gone into the previous Star Wars movie. Um, even though there's great connections to the lore in general, it just felt like a uh, a dismissal of all the stuff that, a for, that uh, a Force Awakens had uh, uh, sort of put on the table. So now it's up to JJ, I think, to kind of resuscitate um, just our our latent love, our, our adoration for this this universe. Um, I don't know if he's going to be able to do it. I think that there's a lot of cynicism around it. The Mandalorian might do it, but it'll be weird if the if Episode 9 doesn't rock our socks, and then Mandalorian is awesome. That's not a win for Lucasfilm or Disney. They, they both have to be awesome, you know, and then Obi-Wan has to be awesome. And we'll see, uh, but I know that it's probably affecting the um, uh, Galaxy's Edge. I don't know if you guys have been reading that or hearing about that, but the, uh, the turnout for Disney's Star Wars theme park hasn't been everything that they'd hoped it would be. And part of it is the, uh, they warned the, that the crowds would be super heavy. And I think part of it is that everybody's got a little bit of Star Wars. I don't know if it's fatigue. I think it's um, Star Wars uh, wait and see, I think, is uh, a little bit more of it. I think, uh, I think people want to be, I think people want to believe again, you know? So we'll see. Um, Certainly, they have a really incredibly talented group of people behind the scenes trying to make us lots of fun Star Wars stuff, so we'll see. Uh, comment, waiting for Soulstorm. Uh, Sekiro deserves a uh, Game of the Year notice. I was just thinking about Sekiro. I want to go back to that again. That game was phenomenal, even though I suck at it. 
Disney butchered Star Wars from Rick Savage. Did I get a chance to play Remnant from the uh, Remnant from the Ashes? No, I have not. That's the challenge of uh, running EP without the team that I have. I just don't have been able to see everything. I just don't have the time to play every single thing out there. And that sucks, man, because uh, we, we did a pretty good job at being able to have different people on all of this stuff and cover it all. Um, but uh, I think we're doing all right for the resources that we have to get to as much as we possibly can. I've heard Remnant from the Ashes is pretty fun, though. Um, I am waiting for Soulstorm as well. Can't wait for that. That's the odd world Soulstorm. Uh, what's your prediction on Modern Warfare from Adrian Leon? Uh, I think it's going to be... Another Modern Warfare game. <laughs> I, you know, as I was playing Gears, I was like, wow, it's Gears. It's, Gears is back. This is so much fun. And now I want my Call of Duty hit as well. Like, I always have a good time with the Call of Duty games. I, I was really impressed with the uh, the single player walkthrough demo that I got, and I was super impressed with the multiplayer. They feel like two different games, kind of like what Gears offers in a way, you know. Like there there's there's uh, um, a diverse assortment of modes. Uh, I, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to be huge, and I think that there's going to be some some really big controversy in that game uh, when it comes out. Um, but I am looking forward to it because I know, again, Infinity War, just like the Coalition, has been killing themselves to make something really special for us. Uh, okay. And Dr. Gamelove says, to be fair, though, the main ride hasn't opened yet at, uh, at Galaxy's Edge. That was another reason that, that the, the fan turnout hasn't been as big as everybody wanted it to be. Uh, is it better to hold the remote with middle fingers hovering above the triggers or resting underneath? Uh, I don't know what you mean. For the controller? I don't know what you mean there, Cody J. Um, everybody holds the controller separately. Sam I am 111, or individually. Sam I am 111, question, what classic Disney collection should be released after Aladdin and the Lion King drops? Um, great question, Sam I am 111. Super excited. Yeah, I, I announced this on Twitter, but we did the making of Aladdin for that collection. Uh, which comes out. So we shot the video content and cut it all together. It was Blake actually who went down on the, the trip and shot it all and he's cut together some wonderful pieces. So you're going to see a little documentary um, uh, making of uh, the original uh, 90s Aladdin game for the Sega Genesis with the original team. It's super cool. I can't wait for you guys to, to check that out. Next uh, Disney collection, they should do like a Mickey Mouse collection. There were a lot of really good Mickey Mouse titles in the 16-bit era, and I think it'd be really fun for them to collect all of those. That'd be great. Uh, question, are you getting a, uh, a Polymega, and if so, which modules are you looking to get? Uh, I'm definitely getting a Polymega. I'm gonna be probably asking for a review unit, to be honest. I wanna check check out the whole thing. Um, so hopefully they send me as all of the modules so we can test them all out here live. Uh, but I'm very excited to be able to dig into that, particularly to uh, be able to access, I have this massive library with EP's library here of all of these classic CD-based systems and all, lots and lots of games. So I want to go back and play all of those through HDMI, through the cleanest signal possible. And I'm very hopeful that the Polymega um, kicks some serious butt. So I'm excited for that. I, I, uh, I bugged them once or twice since we had okay. uh, Brian on, the CEO uh, of the company. And, and that interview was a lot of fun, by the way. If you haven't checked that out, you should. Um, but uh, I, I don't have any news for you on when we're going to get one of those suckers in here. But uh, rest assured, we definitely will. Um, this is going to be the last question, everybody, because I've got to wrap it up. I've got a, um, uh, a movie date with Johnny Millennium, and uh, I've got to race out to go and see him. Um, this is from Tyler Fisher. Okay. Question, will you have Mike Micah on as a guest at least uh, uh, once each month? Uh, <laughs> do, do we all love Mike Micah? He is the damn best, isn't he? Wasn't that a fun day when we had him on the show? I love that guy. Uh, I'd have him on every month. If he's, if he's got the time to be on EP every month, I'd have him on every month. Um, he is right. a wonderful Thank champion you. of video games, and, and uh, I'm a huge fan of all of the work that he does, and I'm just a big fan of him, so... Uh, Good question. Let's see. Maybe we'll get him back on very soon. Okay, you guys, that is going to do it for this episode of EP Live. Uh, now, normally we would be back with a new episode on Friday, but there's actually an event here at uh, the VFS Cafe 
Um, and I'm also hosting at the uh, External Development Summit, which is happening right now in Vancouver, and the wrap party, which I'm hosting, is on Friday. So we've decided we're, we're going to take a break on Friday, uh, but we'll be back Monday, Wednesday, and Friday next week with new episodes. I'm working on the, uh, the guests for that, so watch our Twitter feeds and our Facebook feeds. Uh, we'll have Discord. more information. <laughs> and Discord. <laughs> Thank you, Darth Taz. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, know, we'll be back with some really, really hot stuff. The Game Valanche has just begun. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll We'll see you on Monday, and until then, play forever.